this is great. We're already going. So tell me about the first time you met John Adam or vice versa, John. I'll, I'll let Greeny uh, take it. Greeny, go ahead. Yeah, well, I think uh sort of been during my Bat Boy era, um, in the mid eighties. Um yeah. You know, I, I was one of the few bad boys to ever get traded. I got traded from the home clubhouse to the visiting clubhouse. So our, our time together was a little limited early on in my career. But then uh, uh, when I started my PR interning and moving into the PR department in the late 80s, um, certainly we spent a lot more time together, a lot more, a lot of fun, um, a lot of fun bus rides and spring training and all kinds of good stuff along the way. We were talking yeah. to Scott Carl about that yesterday, Johnny, right? Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, we talked about the dreaded uh, bus ride down to Tucson, <laughs> and and I, I said, you know, um, it wasn't like the old days, eighty one, eighty two, eighty three, when we had to start at Sun City, Arizona, and head to Tucson. Being in Chandler, we were the southernmost, you know, uh, location for a spring training facility, so it, it was almost bearable tolerable the ride but it was a drag but i used to uh, we talked about a couple of the pranks i would pull like hey guys we're going down to tucson we're going to be in a hurry once we get there let's get a quick stretch in as soon as we get there strap it on and then so uh so you don't get screwed up everybody because we're in tucson let's set your clocks back 20 minutes <laughs> Yeah, so I, did it, right? Hey, John, yeah, Reber, really, tell me, um, you told me you wrote a letter to Bud, right, in the early days to get the job. Can you walk us through that, how that happened? Uh, yeah, I was only in sixth grade at the time, and uh, I wanted to be a bat boy, and um, I, my parents said, well, you should send them a letter and tell them you're interested, and that's like, well, I didn't know who else to send it to, so I sent it off to Mr. Seely, because why wouldn't you send a letter that you wanted to be a bat boy? Started right the to top. Who else? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> And uh, he actually sent me a letter back, uh, which I still have. That was back in 1980. And uh, uh, told me I wasn't old enough. And when I was old enough that I should reach out to uh, to Tom Ferguson and Bob Sullivan. Oh, and, boy. Uh, you know, those guys were the ones that would be making those decisions. And uh, the, in uh, September of uh, 1983, I, I uh, did reach back out. And they invited me to come down and spend a day uh, as a shadow. Um, with Steve Fremming, uh, was kind of <laughs> <laughs> driving me, uh, you know, kind of, he was the guy, you know, giving me all the tasks to, uh, to do of what a bat boy does in a given day. And, um, you know, I remember uh, I got there a little early that day and I, uh, was sitting in the, you know, they said, well, just go sit over at that picnic table down there. And, you know, when some of the guys get here, they'll tell you what to do. So, you know, here I am, you know, this is like, a fantasy that I'm sitting in this room watching all these heroes of mine looking at the lockers and you know fingers and Molitor and wow. you know Yount and Cooper and all these names and um it gets to be I don't know was, guys were starting to roll in and uh uh Jeff Tomsky sits down next to me uh wow. it, yeah, if you remember Jeff uh uh he was our uh, bullpen catcher and he was from my side of town uh I was he lived in St. Francis and he was from uh, he went to Thomas More High School, uh, which was you know, where my brother went. And he comes over and says, Hey, you know, nice to meet you. And we talked for a minute. He goes, You're gonna have to get up for here because these guys are gonna come in. They, they sit here and they play bridge before they go out to hit. I'm like, of all the card games I could think of a major league athlete playing, bridge was not on the top of my list. But uh, well, well, I, I let me interject here, Granny. There was only like six guys who were able to play bridge on that team, so it wasn't like every. It wasn't like a game of war. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so yeah, I spent uh, <laughs> spent that one day there, and uh, uh, at the end, it was at the end of the season. So they said, if you're interested in this, you, know, you can come back. We'll have a spot for you in 1984. And um, you know, I, I of course I was interested and in, and in, couldn't wait to start and. Uh, uh, you know, that was the Rene Latchman year uh, when he was oh, yes. there. And uh, it was kind of a big beginning of a little bit of a downturn uh, for the team, you know, while I was a bat boy there. But uh, I'll never forget it. My opening, my first opening day in 1984, I was the ball boy down the left field or sorry, right field line. And it was snowing and 40, you know, like 40 degrees. And it was, it was crazy 
fun. And I was playing catch with Charlie Moore and Harold Baines out in right field. And just, you know, I'll, I'll never forget it. And uh, mm-hmm. it turned into three years of being a bat boy and a lot of unbelievable experiences, uh, meeting a lot of people and uh, getting to know a lot of players and just a really fun time. Does it sound corny? Like with me, I remember the first time I went into the locker room, you know, as a reporter or whatnot. For me, it was just surreal. Do you Was it surreal to you back in the day? I mean, you just mentioned it, but I mean, it's a real thing, a real visceral thing that I still keep with me. Uh, when I was a little boy, I got a, uh, a, a refusal from the Cubs for a bat boy. I'll never forget though seeing that little uh, Cubs insignia, the little logo on the letter, I felt that died and gone to heaven and I was getting rejected. But um, there's still, I walked into a, a, the All-Star Game locker room, uh, the, the visiting, uh, the All-Star Game, and maybe whatever one I went into, and I was just blown away in 2002. Here were these gods that I grew up with. And Johnny, were you ever starstruck, John? Uh, Adam, were you ever in your career? Um, I don't know. I, I don't think starstruck. But, um, yeah, I mean, I appreciated it. I, I, uh, I think my first year, um, spring training, it was a little bit, it wasn't overwhelming, but it was like, wow, this is pretty cool. But you get over that pretty damn quick, you know, <laughs> because it's like, hey, I got to do my job and, and let's just go forward. And, and all the guys were great. And um, they they really uh, were good to me. So yeah, it was it was it was great memories. John Kramer, one one Hall of Famer, one person you met that you were like, dang, this this is really cool. Oh golly, uh, well I can tell you the most intimidating one I ever met. Uh, that was Reggie Jackson. Uh, we were taught when I was in the visiting clubhouse when the Angels would come in uh, with Reggie there. Nobody talks to Reggie. You do not talk to Reggie. Do not make eye contact with Reggie. Uh, you know, Reggie had in the visiting cl- uh, locker room at uh, County Stadium, uh, there was the first locker it was the kind of the big stars locker, and that was Reggie. And um, he was intimidating. Aaron, I mean, just, you know, he looked like a guy you didn't want to screw around with. And I got summoned over to the uh, Brewers locker room, and – Bob Sullivan said, Hey, I've got Reggie's book here. I want you to go get Reggie to sign it. <laughs> and I was like, uh, no. I, uh, I don't know if that's, uh, you know, he's not going to do that. And we're told not to, you know, he goes, no, trust me, just tell him it's for me. I was like, yeah, okay. So uh, we went over and I had Reggie's book and I thought to myself, if I'm going to ask Reggie f- to sign this book, I'm going to ask Reggie to sign this ball for me. Cause if I'm going to get, if I'm going to get shot down it'll get shot down over the book. And if he signs one, he'll sign both. Oh, yeah. So I went yeah, over. And I had the had the book, and I went up to Reggie, and I was I was sweating, and I said, uh, "Reggie, uh, Bob Sullivan, the Brewers equipment manager, asked if you could sign this book for him." And he uh, he looked at me, and he kind of roughly took it from my hand, and took the pen, and he signed it. And I said, "And uh, would you mind signing this for me?" <laughs> so I, you know, if it was personalized, he was okay with doing it. Yeah. If it was, you know, sign the dozen balls on the table. He was a little less against doing that. So yeah, um, he was really good about it. But also, um, we were shorthanded one day and in the locker room. And so I asked my cousin Rob to come and help. Uh, and Rob's a year younger than me. And uh, I told Rob, I said, don't talk to Reggie. <laughs> Whatever you do, just let Reggie do his thing. Just be a fly on the wall. Well, I was the bat boy that series. So I came running up in between innings into the locker room and there was a hitting tee set up in the uh, in the room, which was a little scary because it was surrounded by the mirrors of the room and everything else. And sure enough, here's my cousin Rob having a conversation with Reggie, putting balls on the tee for him. And I'm just like going, oh, dear Lord, this is, this is not going to be good. And uh, they had a perfectly fine relationship. So I think uh, some of that stuff with Reggie was a little bit uh, uh, overblown. But, uh, you know, a lot of times the players were all incredibly kind and generous and, you know, the George Bretts of the world and, you know, guys like that, Jim Rice, um, Mark Langston, you know, I still consider Mark Langston to be a friend, uh, you know, just players over time. And of course the guys in our own room, you know, in the Brewers room, you know, Robin, I consider Robin to be a friend. Um, you know, I just spent some time with Paul Molitor at a golf outing earlier this summer, and that was great. You know, it's just nice when we can all kind of reconnect and spend some time together and 
Um, I got to go to the Hall of Fame ceremonies for Robin and Paul and for Bob Uecker. And, you know, it's just you feel like you're part of the group. And uh, I always try to make it like, you know, these are just regular guys, you know. And once we got along, I think, John, you probably felt the same way. Once you got into it, we're all just regular guys. Mm. Well, and we're all working at the same place. Yeah. yeah. You know, I would argue that the two of you were with a very magical period of this franchise. I, nothing against today or whatever, but something very romantic about your era. You know, the two of you were involved. And so, I mean, the Selig regime, I always felt they took care of us and I felt more like family with them than anybody else. And I was an outsider basically, but John's plural. I mean, you get that feeling that the Selig's had a, it was a wonderful era where you're just not seeing that anymore. You can't see it anymore. It's all well, I, I, I think if I if I could just jump in here, while you're in the midst of it, you don't realize it. Mm. You know, you don't realize that, hey, man, people are going to look back at the 80s and certainly, you know, the mid, the early 90s as, you know, really a special time. You know, a lot of change in baseball during those times, you know. So you don't realize that at the time. Uh, but yeah, uh, you know, the whole Milwaukee in particular being the quote unquote small market, family owned, that type of thing, even though Sealy headed it, there were, you know, many other owners involved, you know, but those days are long gone. I mean, let's face it, not, <laughs> one person cannot, doesn't have the money to buy a team. It, anymore you know it takes a gigantic group of people to purchase a, a major league team now i have to tell you one thing i turned over the locker room big gym once in the early 90s when i started coming out there and the hats the, the, the finances in those days the hats were put in the suitcases you guys know but they only had like one or two now it seems as if the money's so big they could throw them remember even baseballs in your day john did they they didn't give them away to the fans if it was a foul ball, right? You didn't, no, no, right? no, no, no. You, you got a foul ball. If you were the ball boy, your job was to throw it back uh, and then uh, uh, put it in the ba in the bucket that was used for batting practice the next day. And uh, uh, if you got caught giving a ball away, you got uh, you got called out. Oh, yeah. Quickly. Yeah, that was not uh, just – that was just not the way it was done. And it wasn't just – that wasn't a Milwaukee thing. That was just the way it was everywhere. Yeah. You know, as well yeah, as well, to, yeah, to this can, day – to yeah. this day, I mean, you, you know, someone should do a little, little bit on a baseball from the time it comes out of the box mm -hmm. and how it's repurposed, you know, like John said, you know, it starts, it gets rubbed up, mm -hmm. it gets put in the game, it gets fouled, uh, the bat boy down the line picks it up, that ball's thrown out of play, it's like Greeny said, it's put in a bucket, now it goes for batting practice the next day. In batting practice, it gets beat up. If it doesn't get hit over the fence, it gets reused maybe again. But then it goes to another bucket that now it's used maybe just in the cage, you know, nowadays. And then it's used for just hitting off the tee. And then somewhere in its short lifespan, it's it's no good anymore. You know? <laughs> well, it's you not. Know? And it's also like it's crazy to be watching games now where as soon as the ball hits the dirt, it's out of play. You know, it used to be like, no, you throw that back to the pitcher and he does what he does with it. And But now it's the, some of these balls are good for one pitch. Oh yeah. No. And, and that's probably the single biggest expense for a ball club <laughs> is, and balls are not like anything else cheap anymore. It's probably close to 10 bucks for a baseball. Don't they donate them? Doesn't Rawlings donate those? I always assume that just for the PR, they do that. Well, donate them. I mean, the club owns them once they buy them, so it's up to the club what they why, want to do with I, them. I would have thought Rollins would say, well, our name's out there. Let's just give them the balls. It doesn't work that way. No, trust me. I'm paying for hockey pucks. They're definitely paying for baseballs. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that, John? Um, your segue from media director, uh, I don't remember, was it PR media or what was your title, media relations? Uh, director of media relations, yep. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about the segue to what you're doing now with the Admirals. Well, um, Back in 2005, I was uh, sitting in my spring training, uh, my luxurious spring training apartment, and I uh, was after a game was over and uh, just chilling out. And I got a phone call from uh, uh, Harris Turr, who is uh, our owner here at the Admirals. He's also the second largest Brewers investor now, and uh, 
he called me to tell me that uh, he was considering buying the Admirals. Now, I had met Harris um, a couple of years prior to that um, when at County Stadium, he was sitting in on the loge uh, in front of the press box, so on the radio TV side of the uh, loge, and um, he was sitting there wearing a pair of jeans and a sweatshirt, and he was with another buddy who was drinking a beer, and I'm like, oh, well, that's not right. Those guys don't belong over there. So I sent an usher down there, and I said, hey, could you find out who those guys are? And, you know, they don't really belong there. The usher goes down, he goes, he comes back, he says, oh, that guy's working with Bill Schroeder on a golf outing. He just needs to talk to him in between innings. Bill told me, I said, okay, whatever. So the inning ends, and sure enough, they have a conversation, and then Harris and his friend leave, and they go around, and they come back on the other side of the loge, which is the ownership side. And now they're sitting in front of the press box on the ownership side. And that's all I could think of was, man, this guy's really got some stones doing, doing that. So I sent the well, usher. By the way, there's no profiling by you going on, but go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> he kicked me out a bunch of times. So, yeah. Well, the thing is, Harris was like 30 years old. You know, it was it was like oh, my yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. And so he uh, uh, goes down and sits on the other side. So another, I send another usher down and I said, hey, could you go find out, you know, what that guy's deal is? He comes back about a minute later and he whispers Ooh. in my ear. He goes, that's one of our new owners. And I said, I'm going to get fired. This is, <laughs> is going to be great. Yeah. Uh, so I literally got called into Bud's office the next day. Whoa. And, uh, which is, that's yeah, never good when that happens. And he calls me in and I'm standing there. I said, yes, Mr. Sealing. He goes, uh, my understanding is we had an issue yesterday with uh, one of our new owners. Um, and I said, sir, I apologize. I had no idea who that was. <laughs> it's like, you know, and, yeah. and he's got Harris on the phone. And Harris, like about a minute into it, just can't hold back. He starts laughing. So they just called me in to literally give me some crap. And that was my first interaction with a guy who eventually would hire me uh, to become the yeah. president of his hockey team. So uh, he bought the Admirals. He called me and asked me uh, and said he was looking for a president. And literally my first reaction was just running through my mental Rolodex of people that I could recommend to him to take mm -hmm. the job. And he stopped me and mentioned that it was me, uh, which was quite amazing. Uh, but he... I was looking for somebody with PR and marketing uh, to become the president of the team and thought I would do a good job. And uh, a few weeks later, I, we had a press conference at the Bradley Center uh, announcing it. And after 22 years with the Brewers, it was time for me to to try and do this, which has been a real magical ride for me. Um, my first year here, we made it all the way to the finals, game six of the finals and and lost so i'm still waiting to get a ring but uh, uh we've been in the playoffs a lot here and it's just been a blank canvas to do a lot of really fun stuff john you would have uh, appreciated this uh, one of my first years here we gave away jock straps as a uh, giveaway uh because everybody's an athletic supporter um so sure. so and, but I'm bump. yes <laughs> exactly uh gave them away and uh we had about 2000 of them and people were wearing them in all shapes and, you know, wearing them on their heads, wearing them over their pants. It was quite a scene, but sure. uh, you know, it's a minor league team and it's, the, it's the beauty of being able to do some minor league things in a major league market. Yeah. Uh, you gotta be creative. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So <laughs> it's just been a lot of fun, Jim. You, you, you've been to a few games, you've seen kind of what we do and it's uh, it's just the kind of a passion at this point. It's uh, I always tell people find something you love to do and you never work a day in your life. Yeah, and my only problem is it's happening exactly. when I'm my age. But be honest, John, did you watch, like hockey before you took this gig? Was that something you cared about? Uh, I enjoyed hockey. I mean, I, I'd watch Badger games on Channel 10 you know, here at late at night on the weekends. Or, you know, I did, went to a few Admirals games over time. But uh, I wouldn't say I was a hockey expert by any means. I learned a lot from Phil Whitliff, who was the general manager of the team back then. And yeah, uh, I he taught me a lot of hockey in a short amount of time. And uh, but really, you know, we don't do any hockey here. Uh, like our, all of our players and coaches and trainers are provided by the Nashville Predators, who are our affiliate. We oh, are just here. Yeah, so that's all, interesting. Yeah, we okay. just do the marketing and the entertainment, the ticket sales, and um, surround the uh, the sport with entertainment. Wait, I'm not following you. You're not running the organization anymore, like Phil did. Did Phil do that though? No, well, Phil, back then, the, the Admirals had a little bit more say in the hockey side of it. So oh, actually, okay. like, signing players and, you know, doing a little more scouting. 
we said we don't want to do any of that. And so our affiliation with Nashville, everybody in the American Hockey League is affiliated with an NHL team. So there's 32 teams in our league, 32 teams in the NHL. Everybody has an NHL affiliate, and ours is Nashville, which it's been for over 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so our deal is that way we don't have to worry about whether – you know, some guy we signed isn't playing enough or do yeah. right. all the hockey is their responsibility, all of the, you know, getting players physically ready to play all that, you know, we, we outfit them and we pay for the travel and uh, do all that sort of thing. And we pay Nashville a good amount as an affiliation payment to be together. Um, so that's very different than the minor league baseball concept where the minor league team doesn't pay anything. It's just the best place. To yeah. Play. Um, we wish it was like that. We'd be a lot yeah. better. But, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a great run. You're the show yeah. business end of it. Exactly. You're exactly. the marketing. You're the, you know, what's presented to face the customers. I just, I could talk to you all day. I'm cognizant of your time. You know, if you have to hang up, hang up. But I don't know. It's just, it's just so phenomenal the way the games have changed, you know, in baseball mm -hmm. to me. And I don't go, I'll be honest, I don't go to, um, Amfam Field or Miller Park near as much as I did when it was County Stadium. I, I feel a little ostracized. I, I, I don't. I just don't feel as much as I used to for the game, and I'm probably getting myself in trouble with myself here. But do you, you know what I mean, Johnny? You, you... Well, uh, I, if I could just speak to this part, and and Greeny jump in here on this, I noticed a huge change in the vibe our first year at Miller Park. Um, it was, it was brand new and even Milwaukee, you could sense people, they just felt a little bit different. It was like going to visit someone's house that was much nicer, you know, and I just got a different vibe from the fans. Like, wow, they're going to take a while to really feel as comfortable as they did at old rickety stinky county stadium. And um, because Miller park for, as it was originally was really a great facility at the time when it was built, it really was the clubhouses, you know, the, all the other, you know, um, places that were extra that they added storage, indoor hitting, all that stuff. Um, but yeah, it was it was totally different than County Stadium because honestly, <laughs> that visiting clubhouse with uh, Jim Kosinski running it, that was pretty much always voted the worst in the league. That in Detroit's, <laughs> yeah. uh, and I remember, I remember going out one night with, um, and it was early in the evening, and I and I got a phone call. It must have been after a, a Sunday day game in Milwaukee. Okay. We had a Sunday day game. The next day we were going to play the, the Orioles, you know, the Orioles flew in early cause they had a Sunday day game it, somewhere close. It should have, it probably was in Chicago or Minnesota. Anyway, I get a phone call and it's BJ Sir Hall. And, uh, so BJ calls me and he says, Hey, um, we just got to town kind of early. Um, can you meet me at Saz's? And he goes, I'll have a couple guys with me. And why don't we just, you know, a little eat, a little drink there. Uh, you know, we can catch up because BJ and I were really good friends. I said, okay, heck, I'm not doing anything Sunday, you know? And so I, I meet him there and in walks BJ along with, uh, I think Scott Erickson, who was a pitcher with the Orioles at that time and, um, and, and Ripken Jr. So we all sit down and we end up closing the place. But uh, but we were we talked about everything, but it comes up the visiting clubhouse, and as nice as and, and you know him as nice as Junior is, you know Cal just kind of shakes his head and he goes, oh, <laughs> he goes that place is the worst. <laughs> he goes, man, he goes, ah, they got to do something to that place, you know. But it was just you know. It's you're never going to see that again, you know, with the clubhouse guy making spaghetti over a sink that's in between the clubhouse and the trainer's room and people walking by and he's got either a, a, a cigar with an ash that's three <laughs> inches long that's yeah. defying gravity 
<laughs> dropping into the noodles he's shaking. You know, it was just crazy stuff, but that's kind of how the old clubhouse guys did it. You know, whatever was left over from the team that blew out of town on Sunday, food wise, what the heck, don't waste it. Throw it out there for the next team coming through, you know, for they can eat it after batting practice, you know, or whatever. It's true. It's true. It, John it Greenberg, just, you got to write a book like sometime, write a book about that. That was the washer and dryer in Jim's uh, right next to his desk. I mean, yeah, people yeah. wouldn't believe that if they yeah. today. But uh, you, mean, uh, uh, you know, the you know, shucking corn in the middle of the clubhouse uh, to for the post game meal that was always fun. Uh, uh, you know, my locker in that visiting clubhouse was literally, at, if you looked at a picture of it, you wouldn't be able to see where my locker was. It was in a corner between two lockers around, like, you couldn't see me if I was in my locker. Yeah, uh, that was by design. Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> well, I, I mean, for any bat boy or something, just yes. get them any nook and cranny, right. stick mm -hmm. that. And, and the same goes for the old trainer's room. Yeah. It was just an afterthought. Yeah. It was, hey, Whatever this room was for, oh, what the heck? It's a size a little bigger than a closet. Give it to the trainer, and he'll well, stick a whirl. Well, was the whirlpool in the shower? Yeah, I think it was in between. It was a little. It was a little space in between. There was a whirlpool. You had to go to the shower, you walk past the whirlpool. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it was. Yeah, they were wherever they could fit that in. I mean, there were whirlpools in 1953 when they built that room. So, um, yeah, you know, it if was. There was barely uh, a trainer's room. Yeah. Yeah. It was something in there. And, and how uh, about the flooring that was in there? The it green was, flooring with the, yeah. It was yeah. Easy to we, mop. <laughs> it, 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 it was like, it never looked clean. Right. You know, other than the first two minutes after it was, you know, wet, you know, that's the only time it ever looked clean. And I don't know what the material was, but um, as we used to call it, it, it looked like monkey's ass. And, <laughs> and, and, and it was just durable. That's all. You could drop you know, we, anything on it. If we had a rain game and they came up afterwards with the mud oh. and everything else, oh, it, it'd take us three hours to get that floor clean. It was terrible. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but, it was, it was our, but it was our clubhouse, damn it. Yeah. yeah. yeah well, and, and, and how about the walk? You don't see this with new stadiums anymore. The walk from the visiting clubhouse to the dugout. Yeah. It was down the step. Down the step. Yeah. Yeah. Down the stairs, across the concourse, down yeah. the ramp. The only one that was worse than that was in Arlington, at that old stadium. Oh, Arlington. Under, under we used to the, have to walk on the boards and over the water and everything. It was, and well, there and had it, to have been snakes it, and rats it, and everything else in there. Well, yeah, and yeah, and it. I always used to think it's a hundred and six degrees outside. It's July. What is water doing under here? Yeah, you know was, that's disgusting. number one. But I think it came from them spray washing the stands and it coming down. But and Jim, you'll like this one. Not to be a topper. Oh yeah. But uh, I don't know if you ever experienced this one, Greeny. But the old Astrodome to Those get from the yeah. visiting clubhouse down to the, you know, to the dugout on which at the old Astrodome, the visiting dugout was on the third base side. Yeah. It was just a maze going down flights of stairs. But here's the eerie part of it. You must pass probably give, you know, it changed day to day, maybe a dozen stray cats <laughs> down there. <laughs> and every once in a while, there was a little bowl someone had left there with <laughs> water or milk in it it's just like why are you feeding these animals they're going to get the size of a tiger under here you know <laughs> all right but you don't see that in these new ballparks for better or for worse yes. john, john greenberg's got a life we better let him go um yes thanks so much <laughs> john, i could sit here all day with you boys is this Honestly, is let's do it again yeah. in a couple months to see because i want to hear more about these rats yeah <laughs> you know, I mean, no, yeah just to bring it back to spring training uh, John making people look for uh, jackalopes on the ride from uh, Phoenix to Tucson will always be one of my favorite things between that and uh, that we were playing for the Cactus League title and the big screen TVs for everybody. So uh, yeah. you know, we had to make sure that uh, we were very focused with all those games. Well, John told me someone was pissed that someone saw a jackalope once, right? Yeah, Bonnie, 
Greg Vaughn almost got in a fight on the bus ride because he <laughs> swore he saw a jackalope and a lot of guys started laughing at him. And he was ticked that they were laughing at him. And so somewhere, I mean, your mind goes to odd places when you're in the middle of the desert. Trust me. <laughs> yeah. Let's but, do this again next in the spring, John Greenberg. I would love it. I would okay. love it. Thanks Johnny, so Merry Christmas. Good all to see right, you. Man. All of you. Take you care. Take care. All right. Keep in touch. Will do. Bye-bye. Thank you.